Hello, everyone. Um, I am Bob Magna, president of the Rockefeller Institute of Government, and it's um, a great honor to be here. I want to personally thank the chancellor for being here today. Um, I um, think it was a great thing, and I want to thank Joni Mahoney for putting, helping us put this conference together. And I think it's something that's important for the Rockefeller Institute is to not just be in Albany, but to get out on the road, especially in the, our varied and great SUNY system, but especially at a place like ESF, where you're tying policy and um, faculty and scientific issues together in a way that's important to local governments and state governments. So, in a former evil life, I was state budget director in New York, and I knew how good a project was, usually, when people came to present it to me, and I said in a loud voice, how are you going to finance it? And if they quickly gathered their papers up and ran out of the room, I knew it probably wasn't a great project. Um, but if they stood and talked about how, even though it might look like it didn't fit within the state or a local government's financial plan, it was critical to the future over an extended period of time. And so I think that's a great um, re intro to this panel discussion which is about the important issues in financing sustainable projects and, pol and policies. And we have a great and varied panel to discuss that, and I am going to immediately start calling them up. And first we have, um, and it's a great panel because it does um, vary local government issues, also with folks doing research um, at the um, university level. So our first person doing green infrastructure, stormwater, and the financialization of municipal environmental governance, that's a mouthful, is Josh Cousins, Assistant Professor of Environmental Studies here at SUNY ESF. All right, thank you for the introduction. And uh, just maybe to get it out there, I'm also taking maybe somewhat more of a national scale overview, really looking at stormwater utilities um, in the United States. I also want to first thank a couple people who are not present here that really helped me with this work, too. The first is uh, Dustin Hill, who is a PhD student here at SUNY ESF. And the other is Nicole uh, Velez, who is a great undergraduate researcher I had with me uh, who's at Dartmouth College who did a lot of the legwork in getting data for me for this project. So I just want to say thank you to those two people uh, right away. So the uh, title of my talk uh, is really based on a title of a published paper that I'll, I'll link to at the end of the, the talk. But it draws on a lot of the work I've done over the last few years uh, around uh, urban sustainability, uh, climate adaptation planning, uh, largely around uh, stormwater and flood control issues. Um, oh, my image didn't show up there. Um, so imagine an image of a flooded city. Um, so stormwater um, and urban drainage are really among some of the more challenging urban planning uh, and design challenges that we have in the current urban era, I believe. And alongside aging infrastructure, there's also a lot of declining financial uh, resources um, uh, that we have at our disposal to address, you know, whether it's sea level rise, uh, you know, stormwater drainage, um, all these are, are big challenges that we have. Um, and increasingly, we're seeing a range of different strategies cities are using, you know, green infrastructure. China has things they call sponge cities. There's water sensitive urban design. There's all sorts of ways this is communicated. Um, and with this, there's also experimenting with a lot of different funding strategies to implement these types of uh, in infrastructures and really resolve a lot of the funding gaps to address these uh, issues. Um, so to understand this more broadly, um, I, I created this survey. Um, this survey was based on all the stormwater utilities in the United States, all the red dots 
um, indicate people who did not take part in the survey. Blue dots are people who did take part in this. Um, it has expanded more greatly over the last few years. Um, you know, we'll notice that for various reasons, these are relatively absent in the state of New York, although Ithaca uh, has a stormwater utility now. Um, they, they are increasingly growing as a popular means to finance uh, green infrastructure at the, the municipal scale. Um, and part of this is also trying to understand to some extent, um, you know, there, there are a lot of different values and politics that shape governance. And this is just a slide from some previous work that I did. You know, it's a little bit of, you know, academic jargon here, uh, but it's really trying to understand how uh, different views of municipal managers, uh, what views they, they hold, and how that might influence a particular intervention they may have. So this is work I, I did based on managers primarily um, in the, the Western United States of so Los Angeles and California um, and Chicago and Midwest area. Um, and some of it was just, you know, different views around um, whether it's about economic gains, that's the managerialist approach, or really focusing on developing new rules uh, to manage stormwater. Um, but really what I, I wanna get at is there's a whole host of ways that municipalities are trying to rethink uh, stormwater much more as, as a resource. So for a long time, we'd really thought about stormwater as this flood control hazard, this water quality menace, but how can we utilize this more as a resource to help finance uh, some of the, the challenges that you might face um, at the municipal level? Um, and to do this, uh, municipalities are doing uh, a lot of different fee type structures, but by far the most prevalent is uh, the equivalent residential unit uh, measures. So uh, this is when parcels are built on the basis of how much impervious surface area is on the parcel, regardless of uh, total area of the parcel. So it's a, uh, a way of trying to find your relative contribution to the, the stormwater problem uh, at hand. Um, but there's also, also a missing pic picture again, that's okay. Um, we're also seeing emergence of a range of other financial in instruments as well. Um, these are some of the more prominent ones. So we have uh, things like credit rebates and discounts, co-funding, uh, in-lieu fees, uh, which are related to the market costs of remediation, we have things like uh, tax increment financing, which uh, try to use public investments to attract um, capital to specific geographic locations uh, in a city, neighborhood, or district, and use the anticipated property tax increases to fund those projects. Uh, Chicago, for instance, has been a really big leader in using uh, tax increment financing for uh, different projects uh, within the city there. Um, so some, some just questions as I, I was doing this is just like, gosh, how, how is environmental governance accomplished through these different fee structures? So how does municipal operations actually act through these decisions they take to finance different projects? So what is being financed? How is it being financed? Towards what purpose? What are limits and barriers? How might that actually uh, introduce new types of risks uh, into the municipal environment as well? So these are really some of the big questions I, I had. Um, and you know, rather than show you know, a lot of the graphs and, and diagrams I, I had, I, I thought I, I'd just put up a few of the, the key bullet points that came out of this survey um, that I think are somewhat important for maybe thinking about planning and maybe some of the lessons of um, uh, different finance schemes here. So one is just if a green infrastructure or stormwater plan had ecosystem services included, climate change policy was more likely to be going on in that city. Um, and very much uh, associated with different activities uh, associated with household scales, so things like credits and rebates. Um, and I think this is important just in terms of the ways that uh, communities are finding ways to uh, find multi-benefit projects, right? So I think the introduction of ecosystem services as a potential framework in crafting these policies allows more flexibility for municipalities to try and do some of this type of planning. Um, but of course, I am going to show at least a, a couple graphs here, and I'm showing th th this um, as a way of, you know, you can see different activities that are financed uh, here on the, on the, the right or, or left here. Um, and then the other side is the, just the different funding, uh, fee and finance instruments actually used to finance these different projects. Um, easily by far that you see are stormwater user fees. Um, but overall, you know, the, the respondents really, uh, no desire for a mix of fees and alternative financial instruments. So 
they're, they're talking about things like green bonds, mitigation banking, and grants through state revolving funds as really um, the primary mechanisms to address stormwater challenges and build out a mix of green and gray infrastructure uh, for their stormwater management. Um, but I think what we see here that's important is that stormwater user fees are the primary mechanism uh, for connecting stormwater as well as climate action activities. And this is especially the case for activities driven at changing and adapting the physical infrastructure of uh, the municipality. Um, and different financial instruments also tend to focus on different policy aims or infrastructure strategies. Um, credit rebates and discounts, for example, tend to focus on capacity building activities and information development. Um, but beyond fees, um, we increasingly saw the use of in-lieu fees and mitigation banking. Um, in terms of bonds, they were not very pronounced, um, but they are increasingly, so every write-in I had on this survey, um, almost everyone talked about how they wanted bonds. Um, and there are a handful of, of cities who, who are doing this. So Washington, D.C. is very prominent, but it also doesn't come, out, come without risks. Um, and this is, um, I think, something else really important that came out of this study. This is a, a quote from one of the respondents. Um, financing of large projects through loans, bonds, et cetera, may occasionally be necessary. However, debt servicing of those uh, financing methods really hamstrings stormwater utilities uh, from dealing with future current projects. So really, the, the challenge that arose from this, I see I only have one minute, so I'm going to really try and blast through this, um, is that even though green bonds offer a, an important tool or potential solution for financing, they don't come without really important risks and because the debt financing of these projects are really hamstring utilities to, towards implementing things into the future. So many of these projects are financed reactively not proactively. So debt really comes with a lot of issues that might really hamstring different utilities. And I think just Jackson, Mississippi in the news right now is a really good example of this. Um, recent studies, you know, Sage Ponder, a geographer at Florida State, really showed how African-American communities have actually paid more to finance their built environment. And at what cost, really? You know, so there's, there's a lot of issues with financing and how these bonds might actually go through. So um, there's a really fine line of fighting the economic piece of the sustainability question, um, but this equity piece is really, uh, needs to be talked about more directly through these different financing schemes. So hopefully I didn't go too far over. Um, all right, thank you. So they did put me on one that I'm gonna be very opinionated on. Um, Again, financing these things locally is always going to be a challenge. And I, don't, and I think this is an area where you have to think about, does it make sense for state policymakers to think about how they want to finance projects like this? But that's a separate issue. Maybe someone can ask a question about it. Our, our second um, presenter today is, and puts an equation. We have, so we have an equation as our title. Cohoes, New York, floating solar plus decarbonizing historic buildings equals generating energy savings and economic opportunity. And let's welcome um, Joseph Seaman Graves. All right, thank you all. Uh, that saved me some time not having to repeat the title, so I appreciate that. Uh, I do have a lot to get through, so bear with me. The one thing I do want to say is uh, my colleague, Teresa Bourgeois, could not make it today, but uh, we've worked hand in hand on everything you're about to see. Um, so a little overview, Cohoes, New York, uh, northeast corner of Albany County, um, about 18,500 residents in a four square mile area. Uh, so fairly dense, 54% low to moderate income, environmental justice designation, disadvantaged community designation, um, as well as a state approved brownfield opportunity area. The reason I bring this up goes to replicability and for this reason, uh, federal and state leaders are targeting communities like this to be included in the transition to a clean energy economy. Uh, I started November 2019. The Keeler administration came in several months after. Um, right out the gate, we had three main initiatives. So infrastructure revitalization, uh, upgrade and modernize our water systems, improve our gateways, thoroughfares, parks, public spaces. 
store historica hose. Uh, how do we preserve our municipal buildings, commercial and residential as well? How do we leverage the city's rich history and then make connections to the re various resources we have? Um, and then cleaner, greener cohose, which turned into a municipal floating solar demonstration project, um, energy efficient, carbon neutral historic buildings, and LED street light conversions. So within these, um, you know, our main goal is right out the bat, how do we find fiscal savings um, to complete a lot of these revitalization projects? Uh, how do we restore our three main anchor buildings? Uh, all very old and I'll get into, and all have uh, about $10 million each in needs. And then cleaner, greener cohose, how do we generate 100% of our energy demand using renewable sources? Um, I could get into the benefits, a lot are obvious, so I'll go into the barriers quickly. Um, one, we couldn't cut services or raise taxes, that was a non-starter. Uh, we're an LMI community during the pandemic, experiencing inflation and existential fiscal constraints, so we couldn't bond our way out of a lot of these problems. And overarching, we had a limited staff capacity, complex problems and projects, and no obvious funding paths. So while I do talk about financing, I also want to make a very um, uh, important case for Cohoes that the technical assistance um, was as important, if not more, than the actual financing uh, for f two reasons that we found. One being, um, you don't know what you don't know, obviously, so ask as many people as you can. But two, if you get a dollar, you don't want to waste it. So how do you maximize the dollar and try to get more out of that? So I apologize for the picture. Uh, I didn't realize it'd be on such a big screen, and there's probably one more in here of me, so my apologies. Uh, so we started out with purchasing our street lights, uh, about 1,597 street lights from National Grid, and converting them to LED. Um, our year one savings, $352,954. Um, so what we did, we didn't put any escalations in that over 20 years. We said this is our year one savings. If we save more, great. If not, this is where we're at. Um, we bonded money ourselves to not only pay for the purchase and installation of the lights, but we bonded an additional $4.1 million, uh, $3 million to go into our historic building restoration fund, $750,000 for parks, three hundred fifty dollars for sustainability initiatives. The key here is we're not, these aren't one-off projects. These are used uh, as matching funds for grants. So how far can we make these dollars go? Um, and with the money, we focused on our buildings. So we have City Hall, our Music Hall, Library, our three main anchor buildings, all built in the late 1890s or 1800s. Um, all have very similar opportunities, we'll say, um, and we took a very similar approach. So I'll focus on our City Hall, uh, but similar approach to all three. So some of the opportunities, um, you know, we wanted to address the building in a comprehensive manner with an eye towards sustainability develop a project that creates additional financial savings, and then kind of reframe how people think about municipal buildings, uh, because they're not really a hot topic for grants right now. <laughs> so how do you get grants for municipal buildings? Um, barriers, to do it correctly, you want to do all the work at the same time. You don't want to re-scaffold a building three or four times, uh, but it's, it's a massive project. Uh, there's a lack of technical expertise, and then also, it's just not how the funding flows. Um, for our city hall, city hall alone, we currently have four grants, which I'll get into, and we probably need three or four more to make the project complete. Um, so this is why we kind of turned our eye to making it a carbon neutral initiative, and I'll get into the reasoning behind that. But with the bonded money, we started, you know, just basic building condition survey, where are we with the building? We then went into energy audits and thermal scans, we did window mock-ups, designs, which took two years to get approval for and installation just for two windows. Uh, we then got into the roof, um, and that, that's just a multi-year grant approach uh, for two projects for our roof. Um, then HVAC, I mean, there's endless options for HVAC. Our goal was to get the gas out, but how do you know you're doing it the right way? And then without having the windows and roof sol uh, solidified, how do you know that you're making the right choice with your system? So overall, you have this matrix of just options. So what's the right path, and how do we tackle the issues in a comprehensive yet affordable way? I'll hark on the technical assistance being paramount, because you don't want to spend a dollar unless you know it's going to get you where you want to be. Um, now, the other aspect of uh, the buildings that I'll get into a little bit here, um, we want to make them carbon neutral, so how are we going to do that? Uh, so we went into looking at solar. Um, uh, much like um, uh, Mayor Roach, we, we didn't have a, a real clear plan. We just wanted solar in the city. Um, now, we don't have land. Uh, we don't have our buildings are historic. We couldn't do anything mounted on the roofs. Um, and we have very little parking available as it is, uh, even though I would love to put solar panels on every inch of it. Um, so looking at a map, the thing that made obvious sense uh, naively was let's put it on our reservoir. Um, did some Googling. It's a thing. It's pretty uh, common overseas in Asia. It's common in higher elevations in Europe. 
Um, you start making calls to experts, and we realized that the size of our reservoir could actually produce 100% of our municipal energy needs with 40% give or take left over, um, which we are now trying to use with our school district and housing authority. Additionally, it promotes sustainable land use, reduces evaporation rates, reduces algae bloom, um, thus saving money on the chemicals going in to get rid of the algae and the chemicals treating the chemicals to get out, <laughs> um, and offers a highly visible education uh, demonstration tool. Um, now, we, we chose not to go power purchase or lease agreement, which was actually the more naive part. <laughs> so let's put the solar part aside for a sec, or the floating part aside for a sec. And this is the other picture I apologize for. Um, so most municipalities will go into a power purchase agreement or lease agreement, and as was pointed out earlier, the reason is you can't get past those upfront cost barriers. Um, so we didn't know this going into it. I uh, started making a lot of calls. Okay. It seems like this is done off tax incentives, but where are the grants? And there wasn't any. Um, so we ended up uh, kind of paving a little bit of a path and, and uh, working with Congressman Tonko, who championed this project. We actually were able to secure a $3 million federal grant for our project um, because of Congressman Tonko championing this as a replicable project. Um, which then opened up additional grants that we've gotten for the project. Now, the new induction, or re Inflation Reduction Act will have opportunities uh, for direct pay tax benefits. So now there's grants and tax benefits municipalities can access for projects like this. But to kind of go on the replicability, um, yeah, it works for us. We have a reservoir, but we wanted to kind of go a step further than that and show that it, this is, can, is something that other communities can do. So we took a 2018 National Renewable Energy Lab report it said there's 24,000 of these man-made reservoirs that are potentially suitable for floating solar around the country. Um, that, and if used, they can produce 10% of the nation's energy. We partnered with Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute's Idea Lab and actually visualized this on an app you can go on today. Uh, it has not only the location of these reservoirs, potential production, but also economic data that we've layered over. So you can see where the LMI communities are, um, as well as, uh, you know, not to get too much into the weeds, but where are the substations to connect into? <laughs> because that's another challenge with these projects. And this is kind of the simplification of what we're doing. Um, so we purchased our streetlights, converted them LED, bonded the money, had matching funds, um, applied for grants, were awarded grant application, or awarded grants that went into economic development opportunities, our carbon neutral historic building, and municipally owned and operated floating solar all of which are creating additional energy savings through clean energy generation, which goes back to our matching funds and then over to grant applications again, start it over. Um, and, and that's an oversimplification, but this is the, the best I could do in a 10 minute presentation. <laughs> um, now, just to show what we've done in year one, uh, for our bonded funds, um, our $3 million for historic building restoration, we leveraged 540,000 to get us 2.3 million in grants. Our parks, we leveraged 230,000 to get 1.585 million in grants. And our sustainability initiatives leveraged 350,000 to get us uh, 3.75 million in grants. So year one, leveraged 1.12 million to get us 7.635 million. But once again, technical assistance is key. These, this is not a complete list of all the partners we've worked with, and this is just on our floating solar. So we are trying to cast a wide net, get all the information we can, and try to make the right choice going forward. Um, we've also been fortunate enough to have a couple articles, so if you want to read more, uh, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the National Renewable Energy Lab, and the City of Cohoes all have some good stories up. Um, and please contact myself or uh, Teresa Bourgeois if you have any additional questions. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Joseph, as an Albany County resident, I hope we have, you know, application to other places. That, that was great. For our third and, and final presentation, we have Sarah Smiley talking about financing energy efficiency projects for private buildings. Hi everyone, thank you so much. It's really great to be here today. I'm Sarah Smiley. I'm Director of Municipal Membership and Transaction Manager for Energy Improvement Corporation, or EIC. And it's been so exciting to hear about the amazing climate action work that municipalities are taking that we've heard about today, along with our um, 
partner organizations. I'm here to talk about Open CPACE, uh, Property Assessed Clean Energy, which is a financing mechanism that municipalities can offer to help facilitate clean energy upgrades for the commercial building stock in their communities, um, utilizing private capital and not adding any burden to the municipality. Just to give you a little background on EIC, it's a nonprofit program administrator, a statewide local development corporation, and the members of our corporation are those municipalities across New York that have opted into the program. And it's our mission to operate a successful commercial pace finance program to help advance the state's goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and increasing the adoption of renewable energy. So property assessed clean energy, as the name suggests, is financing for clean energy upgrades that is secured through a property assessment. So this is authorized at the state level because New York State recognized that access to capital was a major hurdle for uh, private building owners to make the type of upgrades to cut down on energy waste as well as cutting down on unnecessary emissions from their properties. So this law established that municipalities can fulfill an important public purpose by providing financing for energy efficiency or renewable energy, and they can secure repayment of that financing through an assessment lien that's recorded on the land records for the property. So this is similar to, uh, to funding mechanisms for other more traditionally thought of public benefits like sidewalk repair or sewer and water districts except in this case, instead of applying an assessment to an entire district, it's being applied uh, to the specific property that is benefiting from those improvements. So it is authorized at the state level through that law, and it has to be enabled at the local level uh, through adoption of a local law. And it's done at the level of government that has tax lien authority. So throughout most of the state, that is cities and counties. Um, and in Westchester County, that's the one exception where towns can opt into the program. And EIC, as the program administrator, provides the template local law to the municipality to enable the program. So this is an alternative to a traditional bank loan. It's available for up to 100% of the cost of the energy improvement project, and it's repaid at a fixed rate that can be repaid at a term that can match the expected life of the improvements. So depending on the measures that are being installed, that can be up to between 20 and 30 years. So having such a long term to repay the financing enables lower annual uh, payments for the property owner, which enables them to install more significant improvements that can reduce their operating expenses, as well as providing a significant benefit to the community by cutting down on greenhouse gas emissions from the property. And because it is backed by this assessment, it runs with the property. Uh, the payments do not accelerate, so if the uh, ownership transfers to a new owner, future installments of the assessment transfer to the new owner as well, uh, just as they would pay future assessments for other improvements on the property. And it is called um, Open CPACE because it's an open market commercial PACE program. We currently have 19 capital providers who are approved to participate. So this is utilizing cap private capital. It is not using any municipal funds. And uh, property owners can also shop around among all these different capital providers to see who is the best fit for their particular project. And uh, the lien that is recorded on the land records, EIC records that on behalf of the municipality at the closing of a transaction. That lien is junior to municipal taxes uh, while being senior to any non-municipal liens on the property. And going forward, uh, after the transaction closes, EIC bills the property owner directly, so the municipality is not involved in collecting payment or guaranteeing payment from the property owner, and the charge is not on the tax bill. Um, and I would also just add that because it's an alternative source of capital for the property owner, they can reserve their other sources of capital that they might need for general business needs and their other lines of credit. So it can motivate them to move forward with improvements that they might otherwise be putting off because they're prioritizing other business needs. Developers find PACE attractive because it can offset higher costs of capital that they might be looking at, like mezzanine debt. And because they can only use PACE for um, measures that reach higher standards of energy efficiency, this is incentivizing more sustainable development. So they're including measures because they can access this financing that they might otherwise cut from the construction budget because they're more expensive. 
And depending on the lease, they can transfer the PACE charge to tenants uh, who are also benefiting from lower operating costs and more comfortable building because of the measures that have been installed. Essentially, any building can qualify for PACE financing as long as it is owned by a commercial entity, including not-for-profits. Um, if it's a multifamily building, we do require that there are at least five units in the building. This is strictly for commercial properties. It can't veer into single-family homeowner properties. And it cannot be used for anything that is owned by a municipality because the payment is secured through this lien against the property. Um, the measures that can qualify for PACE financing are determined by NYSERDA. So they've created these uh, commercial PACE guidance, and that's what EIC uses to make sure that the project that's applying for financing is, in fact, uh, providing this public benefit. So essentially anything that is going to save energy on the efficiency side or generate renewable energy on site can qualify for financing. And there are multiple pathways to take to qualify. Um, the capital provider who would work directly with the property owner on the application, they would submit the energy study or feasibility study. It can be for a single measure. So if there's a you know, major piece of equipment that the building owner wants to replace, or it can be a whole building renovation with multiple measures. This also can qualify for new construction projects. So um, a few ways to qualify new construction would be if they're going through a higher um, energy code standard. So if the building's going to meet Energy Star certification or LEED certification, if it's being built to Passive House standard or New York stretch code, then it automatically qualifies for this financing. And, um, EIC has an independent engineer who reviews the scope of work um, and confirms the effective use of the life of the measures before we can approve the financing to move forward. I've included some sample projects that have uh, benefited from this financing. First one right here in Syracuse, the Marriott downtown. It's a 1920s era building that was undergoing some major renovations and adding additional rooms. So they use PACE financing to increase the efficiency of the building as part of that process. So they um, improve the building envelope, improve the HVAC measures, uh, as well as the lighting and electrical systems. This is an example of an agricultural um, project that benefited from PACE financing. Uh, this is a 12 and a half acre greenhouse farm in Niagara County. And they use very, thank you, very energy intensive operation. They use PACE financing to install measures to dramatically reduce um, the uh, energy use of the property and give them greater control over heating and cooling as well. Uh, this is the first uh, new construction multifamily project that used uh, this program. And so, as I said, it motivates a higher standard of, of building from the ground up if it's used for new construction. So to qualify for PACE financing, they had to build this to above energy code standards. And this was the very first new construction project uh, that utilized PACE in New York. This was a boutique hotel in Ulster County that used PACE to achieve Energy Star certification for the property. And this is an example in Suffolk County, one of several uh, solar projects that have utilized PACE in this case, uh, uh, owner occupied light industrial building. The owner wanted to benefit from their roof space, as Mayor Roche has talked a lot about this morning, um, wanted to generate revenue from their rooftop and use pace to avoid any upfront costs for the installation. So because this pro um, program was designed so that municipalities can offer the public benefit of PACE financing without taking on any administrative burden or any financial risk because they're not involved in the collection of payment, we've seen a lot of interest all across the state. Um, we've also seen a lot of interest from property owners and developers who are looking for the source of financing to get their projects done. And most importantly, seeing a lot of uh, benefit to the communities through a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, which is the mission of the program. And you can look on our website to see more examples of projects. There have been uh, several adaptive reuse projects where buildings were converted that had been sitting vacant and used this tool to increase the efficiency as part of that process. Um, I won't go through this name by name, but you could see these are the counties across New York State that have opted in. Hopefully you see yours on the list. And here are the cities. And these are also listed on our website for your reference. 
And as I said, Westchester County, the towns opt in separately. So these are listed here, as well as the Village of Hastings on Hudson. Um, and if you don't see your municipality on the list, I encourage you to reach out. Um, and I can provide documents and material to help discuss with your municipality about offering this resource to the business community um, to help them make these upgrades to improve the building stock. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks to the other panelists. I love the financing stuff. It's great. This is where the rubber hits the road for a lot of accomplishing you know, the stuff we're here to talk about today with respect to sustainable policies. So questions for our presenters? Uh, this question's for Josh. Um, did you guys see any association with increased regulation on stormwater management um, associated with the establishment of stormwater utilities? Um, yes. Uh, uh, you know, a, a big driver was, you know, something like a consent decree. So, you know, Washington, D.C.'s uh, experimentation with bonds, for instance, is very much tied to a uh, consent decree with uh, the EPA. So there's certain drivers towards that. Um, but be, a dry, uh, something like a consent decree does not necessarily lead directly to a utility. So a lot of places want utility fees um, because, you know, within planning, you know, stormwater is a classic fiscal orphan, right? They, they want some sort of dedicated revenue stream. Um, but they often come into uh, legal contention because often viewed as a tax, not a fee. Um, so there are a lot of legal barriers in terms of finding that dedicated revenue stream. So even if there is a strong regulatory push that doesn't directly lead into uh, the development of a utility fee because there could be a lot of legal pushback. Tax fee, left pocket, right pocket. <laughs> exactly. This question is for Sarah. I appreciate the presentations of all three. I'd love to ask you all more. But for Sarah, you had a list of, let's say, energy efficiency improvements that had been approved by NYSERDA. And we're sitting at ESF, and I have to point out that shade trees will really reduce the energy load on buildings. And that wasn't on the list. And I would encourage people to think about that and discuss how that, how that works. They're not in contradiction to doing photovoltaic. You can certainly place trees strategically. And if you deliberately reduce the amount of the solar load on the external walls, you can go a long way to making it greener, even if you already have in place a lot of energy efficient HVAC systems. That's great to know. I, the, um, the measures that qualify, they're determined by NYSERDA, so we'd have to discuss with them if those are, are you know, those types of improvements, planting trees could be included. Um, the measures have to either be proven to be cost effective through a cost benefit ratio, so it depends on how much energy savings the trees would generate, um, uh, unless um, NYSERDA determines that there's sort of a pre qualified measure that are considered cost effective. I would love to speak more with you offline. We have an iTree tool to quantify that energy okay. savings from shade trees. Great, thank you. I'll have to do that. Other questions? Am I allowed to have a question? Sarah, so I'm assuming that because of the way your program runs, you get some benefits of scale, right, that translates into better rates and things like that, or? Yeah, so that's the, um, you know, the goal of the program is to provide um, great source of capital. So we have, as I said, 19 uh, providers on our list. Um, to make it a competitive environment so that can help drive down rates and provide better terms for the property owner, absolutely. Thanks. Other questions? If not, I want to thank the panelists very much. 